Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Be welcome to EA2. I'm Professor Thiago Girelli, Project Coordinator of EA2. Me and Professor Sueli Polidoro, our General Coordinator, are glad you came for the presentation. Innovative Integrated Approach, Vertical Integrated Project, VIP, which I'm sure will open our minds to a new way of teaching, and why not? A new way of researching too. Our speaker today, Professor Edward J. Coyle, received his BS degree in Electrical Engineering from the University of Delaware in 1978, and his PhD degree in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science from Princeton University in 1982. From 1982 through 2007, he was a faculty member at Purdue University where he served as Assistant Vice Provost for Research and co-director of the Center for Wireless Systems and Applications. He is also co-founder of both the Engineering Project in Community Service Ethics Program and the Vertically Integrated Projects, VIP Program. During 2006-7 academic year, he was the Kingdom Trust Visiting Professor at Princeton University Dr. Coyle joined Georgia Tech in January 2008. There, he holds the Arbutus Chair for the Integration of Research and Education, he is a Georgia Research Alliance eminent scholar, and is the director of the Arbutus Center for the Integration of Research and Education. So, we from EHU and the Cup would like to thank you, Professor, for being here today. And now, uh, let's welcome Professor Edward J. Coyle.
when your experience is chopped up into semesters and academic years, and uh, it's very difficult to have an experience that cuts through all of your time on campus and is thus uh, coherent. Um, so that affects the undergraduates, and it keeps them from really applying their talents to doing something uh, new and big. Uh, the fragmentation by mission, this affects primarily uh, professors, research staff, uh, and their, your activities are broken up into innovation or research, what you do in education, which is usually a lecture and class. Uh, and finally, service, which means many, many different things. It can be service on the committee, service to the community. Nowadays, it even includes uh, startup companies. Um, and then finally, the one we're all familiar with, because everybody in here has declared a specific uh, discipline to be their home, is uh, this fragmentation. And it's due to the scholarly background of the university, where you try to classify all the different forms of knowledge and the different things that uh, you can do with that knowledge. And uh, nowadays, it takes the form of what I call the thinkings. You've probably heard of scientific thinking and design thinking and computational thinking. And as I, at Georgia Tech, as I go and I talk with people of different disciplines, I've had them tell me, well, you're an engineer, so you use design thinking. You know, this is science, we use scientific thinking. And so there's no way what you want to do would work over here. So I always ask them if I'm not allowed to use scientific thinking in my own work, <clears throat> and if they are not allowed to use design thinking. Uh, so the barriers here are very artificial. Uh, which actually, in the end, made them very easy to overcome. Okay, so those are the three barriers. And the history of this program, which is 23 years old, is actually how we overcame those barriers one at a time. So first in 1995, uh, two of us at Purdue uh, launched a program that we call Engineering Projects and Community Service. That's a very nice acronym, EPICS. And uh, the goal at that time was to provide, create vertically integrated teams. So these were teams of mostly engineers uh, from freshman, first year, second year, through final year students uh, that all worked on the same team for many semesters, earned credit and were graded each semester. And they worked on projects for the local community around the university. And what we found with this program was that it worked really well. It unleashed the creativity and talents of our undergraduates. And which when you think about it, you know, you have some of the brightest people in your country here at your university, and yet all they do most of the time is sit in your classes. So if you give them an opportunity and the right structure, they can really be productive and really be creative. So that's what we found with this. Over a period of about five or six years, though, we discovered that we were having trouble keeping the advisors interested in advising the teams, because they weren't getting teaching the least time for it, and it was also not helping their research in terms of research grants brought in, or publications. So this worked for the undergraduates, it didn't work for graduate students, and it didn't work for faculty. So in 2001, we went to VIP 2.0, where we take the same team structure for the undergraduates, where we add master's students and PhD students and postdocs to it, and the teams, instead of uh, working for a community service organization, are actually working for uh, the faculty on campus. So some of those projects may still be community oriented, but they don't have to be community oriented. And so uh, here each team is requested by some professor or some research staff member, and they're working with them on things that benefit everybody. And we found out over five years that that worked really well. Uh, but it was still mostly an engineer. So when I moved to Georgia Tech in 2008, uh, one of the things I wanted to do when I moved there was to prove that uh, VIP would work in every discipline. And I truly mean every discipline on campus. Uh, so that was the hypothesis, and we've basically been proving that it's correct. Uh, as you'll see, every one of our VIP teams is multidisciplinary. And not because they're forced to be multidisciplinary, because the nature of the project requires multiple disciplines to be successful. And by the way, if any of you have any questions, feel free to stop me and ask. And Cristiano can uh, help translate uh, if you prefer to speak in Portuguese. Okay, so, so this is the VIP approach. 
this integrate innovation in that broadly defined version of it, plus education. We give the undergraduates the time and the structure to enable them to be productive. The context is the research activities of professors and graduate students and postdocs. And then uh, everybody on a particular VIP team, they're all interested in the same thing. Is it too loud or too soft? Too soft. Okay. And so you, great, you get a great uh, mentoring structure within the team. And what that means for me is I know all of the undergraduates on my team personally because they're typically on my team for at least two years. So this is all VIP does. It looks very simple, but it took us a long time to get here. And with each innovation, it took four or five years to prove whether it worked or didn't work and to improve it. So the idea is students need some real projects to work on uh, to apply all the things they're learning in class and to really unleash their energy and uh, creativity. And the professors and the grad students and the research staff, they can always use help with the types of uh, research work they're doing. So that's the image to keep in mind. And I just put the National Science Foundation logo up there for the US just to represent research. So here are the basics of the program. Um, every project team is created for and led by um, a professor and his or her colleagues and their graduate students. And the projects are embedded in their research activities. And the teams are large. This is what really surprises most faculty, uh, most professors. Typically 10 to 20 undergraduates. At Georgia Tech, our average team has 16 undergraduates on it, one to three graduate students, and one to three uh, professors or research staff as advisors. And at the undergraduate level, there are second year through final year students on every single VIP team. Each student can remain on a team for up to three years, earning academic credit and being graded each semester for what they contribute to the team. When students graduate, uh, they are replaced on the team by uh, new second and third year students. So the team always maintains its same size, and the returning students train new students each semester, which takes that burden off of the professors and the graduate students. And, and then, what's the beauty of it is that uh, you can draw students for your team from whatever discipline your project needs to be successful. So teams continue for many years. Uh, my team, as you'll see in a second, uh, is 18 years old now. Now, we're not doing the same thing we were doing 18 years ago because it's evolved with my research. But that shows you how you should think about these teams. And again, the students get academic credit each semester. Okay, this is a photo of my team from about five years ago. My PhD students, uh, there are actually three of them in the photo there, uh, are on the right hand side. All the rest are undergraduates, and there are four students who went there that particular day. So these are big teams. And each one of my graduate students is usually associated with one sub-team of this big team. And so it's a mix of second, third, fourth year, final year students. Um, I typically have students from electrical and computer engineering, computer science, industrial engineering, and management uh, on my team. And what do we do? This is our test bed. This is the football stadium. Yes, it's American football um, at Georgia Tech. You know, it's kind of unusual. Sports is a really big thing at American universities. Uh, and from our point of view, that's kind of nice because we get this great test bed. And it's of interest to me in electrical and computer engineering because you have 55,000 people in there, all of whom have smartphones, which have cellular, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and eventually other things. You have all the media people in there. Uh, they have their own communication and channels and devices. So it's a very, very rich environment uh, from a radio frequency perspective. And so we study all sorts of things about that for my research. And what my team does is we, they build systems that we deploy in the stadium uh, to provide services to fans in the stands, collect sensor data, process it, and make it available. So uh, we have a very good relationship with athletics. We actually have some systems that I'll show you that are deployed in the stadium. And I could not do this without my VIP team. So this is something my VIP team has given to me that I didn't have before. So the first thing we did, um, and I gave away the year we did it, it was in 2001, uh, 
we can collect short video clips of each play in the football game. You know, typical play in American football lasts maybe 30 seconds to a minute. And so nice video clips. And we would annotate them with the official description of the play. Uh, we'll also do some graphical things with them and make that available to fans in the stands over either cellular or Wi-Fi networks. So we were the first people to do this anywhere in the world in 2001. Uh, the project was supported by Cisco um, for about $600,000 to outfit the stadium with Wi-Fi and also you know, support what the team is doing. Um, and you can still look at this today. You go to eStadium.gotech.edu. Uh, the next thing we did was uh, for other stadiums like for baseball, uh, older stadiums are very hard to rewire, very expensive. So the team actually designed a Wi-Fi mesh network that's deployed in the baseball stadium at, at Georgia Tech. Uh, that's one of the notes. We bought the hardware, but the students did all the software for it. Uh, we also designed and built sensor networks, uh, both for sensing the RF communication channels and for sensing how the stadium shakes uh, during football games. And I'll show you some of that data. But this is the sensor here. It's an accelerometer that's held on to my magnet to the steel girders in the stadium. And then the embedded system that collects the data, digitizes it, and transmits it wirelessly back to us is inside the box. And so there's a photo of one of the nodes actually up in the stands. So it's not powered, it's battery powered or solar powered. And it transmits data wirelessly. And uh, last semester we had four of them out there at different locations in the stands. And we were primarily interested in monitoring the structure uh, for, uh, uh, for maintenance purposes and other purposes. But as we collected data, we found out that there were some other neat things we could do with it. And that's just how we collected data. So that's the system that was out there last year. And again, I couldn't have built and deployed something like this without the undergraduates on my VIP team. And the first time we collected data, uh, this is the equipment out there. And it's sitting up here. And this is the data that we saw coming in. So this is the acceleration of that part of the stands in G's. So very small G's, 0.001 uh, G's. But remember, force is mass times acceleration. And the mass of the north stands is very large. It turns out fans, when they fill up the stands, can generate a lot of force when they all jump up at the same time. And so we notice very quickly that we can see when touchdowns occur. Uh, we can see when this is an advertisement on the big screen of under the stadium that gets everybody bouncing up and down to create excitement during the game. And this is when halftime starts, so this is the beginning of the game to halftime, this is somewhere in the third quarter. And you can see when people get up and start walking around to go and use uh, restrooms and go buy food. So now what we know is that these other spikes are associated with other plays that fans got excited about. And so now, in addition to having video clips available by time, you can see any play in the game by time, we also have the most popular plays on a separate page. So you can see the most popular play from the first quarter, second quarter, and so on. So everything that we've talked about is actually all tied up into one huge project. OK, so that's some detail about what one team does, and that's just my team. At uh, Georgia Tech, we have a total of 70 teams now, and uh, more than 1,000 undergraduates enrolled this semester. Our long-term goal is to have three to 400 teams, and at least half of the undergraduates on campus involved uh, on teams that they choose. Uh, we have students and uh, professors from every single discipline participating in this. Um, and now I'll show you the, the list of VIP teams. And you can tell me which ones you'd like to join. This is a team with sociology that looks at uh, what makes the difference between students who graduate, persist to graduation uh, during the tech, and those who fail to graduate? We have some robotics teams, um, we have a team looking at advanced batteries. Uh, this is a DARPA challenge team looking at next generation communications. Uh, this team is really fun. 
this uh, yellow thing in the middle that looks like a torpedo is actually a robot all folded up. They drill a hole through the ice in Antarctica and they drop it down to the water that's underneath the ice and it samples the, uh, the biome that's under the ice. Um, augmented reality. Uh, this is a biology team. Um, now let's click on this one. So this team studies bee populations in the city of Atlanta and on campus and in the area around Atlanta. As all of you may know, uh, bee death and uh, bee colony collapse is a huge issue in sustainability nowadays for agriculture. And this shows you what you have to describe uh, for me to decide whether you have a VIP team or not. What the goals of the team are, methods and technologies, research issues, meeting, who the advisors are, um, what partners you might have, either on campus or off campus, uh, and what the different majors will be doing as part of your VIP team. So, uh, Jennifer Levy is the primary advisor for this. She's in biology. And on the right hand side here, uh, these are all, they're looking for students from all of these disciplines to participate in this team because they all have something to do with uh, 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 bees and populations and growth. So, for instance, the mathematics students look at birth death processes and figure out what the parameters are that best match what they're seeing in the bee populations that they're monitoring. This is a big data in quantum mechanics, uh, biobots, this is a chemistry team, this is a biomed team that looks at speech processing and how it can assess various types of brain trauma, and they're in the process of trying to spin off the app that they developed, which can be used for uh, therapy for people who suffer brain injuries. Um, this is civic design and uh, civic data design, which is actually a service learning team, so the original portion of EPICS. Uh, which was devoted to community service is still alive within VIP. Um, Data-driven education. This is a team that actually studies all the online tools that have been developed for a set of courses in physics, uh, down to the individual clicks uh, that students make um, to be able to identify students who are struggling and those who are succeeding. Uh, this is one of my favorites. This is a philosophy team. <laughs> and what this team does is the, the advisor is a specialist in argumentation theory and there are students on the team from computer science and computer engineering and they scrape arguments off the web you know, from Twitter feeds and um, uh, other sources like Facebook and they study the types of arguments that are used in different situations and the goal is to eventually design some type of platform where discussions would be more civil. Very timely team. <coughs> This is physics and biology, uh, exploration of Mars. Um, our first science team was a gravity waves astrophysics team. It's a group that worked on the LIGO detector. Um, so, this, and this is actually a team that works for campus, uh, improving the transportation system on campus. It comes out of industrial engineering and computer science. So I think you can get an idea of, of the wide variety of, of teams. And the variety is controlled completely by uh, professors and, and what they would have, like to have a team do with them. And I say do with them because it's not just for them. So here's the history of growth at Georgia Tech in terms of the number of students in VIP each semester. And so remember, I've been running at Purdue for many years before I moved to Georgia Tech. And we started up in 2009 with the goal of making it be campus wide. And we got up to about 15, 16 teams when we realized we needed some really nice tools for grading and peer evaluation and doing commissions for the program. So Randy Abler, who's a co-director with me, we stopped taking new tools, developed those tools, and then after we deployed it, we opened up the doors again. And as you can see, we're in the process of scaling to very large, very large sizes. Uh, long term, as I said, we're after seven or 8,000 students. Um, and those tools that we developed are available to any university uh, that has a VIP program. This is one of my favorite slides because um, this is a list of the teams. Each team is one of these bars. The height of the bar is the number of students on the team. So our biggest team uh, this semester actually has uh, 53 students on it. The average team has 16. New teams tend to start out smaller with around 6 to 8. And they're included in an average of 16. But all the teams are big. 
And then the colors are actually the different disciplines participated in each team. And there are so many colors now they're a little hard to distinguish one from the other. Um, but those are uh, the disciplines of the students who are currently uh, participating in VIP uh, by degree. So we really do span all of campus. Uh, this is the longevity of teams. Uh, my team's at the top. It actually goes right back here because it started when I was at Purdue. Uh, there are teams that end when faculty retire or move somewhere else. Uh, one of the essential things is as a VIP director, I have the power to uh, kill off a team if, it's, if the advisor's not doing a good job. Because students participate by permit only. And if an advisor's not doing a good job, no more students you know, after that semester. Um, but we have a lot of teams at Purdue that are still been around for you know, 10, 15 years. And we've had a number that have been at Georgia Tech for the duration of the program so far. A uh, third of our teams, the advisors are themselves multidisciplinary. Uh, enrollment by year is pretty well balanced. Most students nowadays take five years to graduate. Uh, so this is a mix of fourth year and fifth year students. Second year students, third year students. And then there are also graduate students participating. And this is where all of our advisors come from. And as we extend into new colleges, we pick up more and more faculty from those colleges. Um, we started off in engineering, um, added computing, then added science. Um, and GTRI is a soft money research institute. Um, and they have, they're really interested in having VIP teams too, because they do a lot of research. Uh, enrollment by major, kind of like the previous slide, only done as a pie chart. Uh, so you can see where we started engineering and computer science, but all the other sciences and um, other disciplines are starting to grow. And this is probably the most important, this slide and the next slide are the most important for structuring your own VIP program. These are the courses that support it. So we were the first program at Georgia Tech to have our own subject code. This is not electrical, computer engineering, or physics 2601. It's VIP 2601. And it recognizes the fact that the program is campus-wide. And second-year students can participate for one credit per semester by enrolling in this class. Third-year students can take it for one or two uh, credits per semester. Three in some departments. Same thing with fourth-year students. There are courses at the graduate level also for uh, non-thesis master students. One, two, or three credits that count towards their degree. And then on the right-hand side, uh, these are for students who are being paid off of your uh, research grants. So I tend to use that when a student on my team has been on there for a long time, and no more, no more VIP credits would count towards his or her graduation, so I start to pay them out of my research grants. Because by that time, they have a lot of experience. And the grading process, every student is graded the middle and end of each semester. And it's a letter grade. There's no pass-fail, no volunteers, no auditing. And there are peer evaluations that help the advisor understand what's going on on the team, as well as input from the graduate students who are helping to advise the team. And there are three components to the grading. Uh, one third is documentation. Each student uh, keeps a journal of what they do. You know, it could be a lab notebook if you're in science, it could be a design notebook if you're in engineering. And you know, the team maintains its own collective conscience, consciousness on the wiki. Uh, softwares, GitHub, uh, presentations and reports are all on. You also judge the individual contributions by each student. You know, how much have they contributed to moving the project forward, given what, how long they've been on the team, what year they are as an undergraduate, and what discipline they are. Then finally, teamwork. Are they actually helping the team progress by working closely and effectively with each other? And we have grading tools and peer evaluation tools for all that. Um, this is the grading tool the faculty would see. So I've learned, this is real data. So I've actually covered up the students' names. Each row here is a particular student. And this would normally be their email address in case you wanted to send an email. And so we can tell you know, how many credits they're taking this semester, what's, what year they are, what major they are, how many semesters they've been on the team already, and then if you click on this, you can see the wiki entries made by that particular student. You can see the peer evaluations of that student by the others, or by that student of the others on the team. And then there's a grading form that you would fill out. Uh, 
when it's starting to go gray. And the gray form looks like this right now. We're uh, creating a better, better looking version of it. And we're also shrinking the number of categories. And then each student gets written feedback uh, twice a semester from their advisor. So this is something that I told one of the students who'd been on my team for three semesters and was taking up a leadership role. And he was actually stepping in a difficult situation because the previous team leader, sub-team leader, did not do a very good job. Uh, but he was coming up the street very quickly. So that's the type of mentoring that you see in projects like this. This isn't any more time consuming than grading hundreds of exams or hundreds of essays. Um, so team size average 16, most teams have sub-teams, um, and we use peer evaluations to study the structure of the sub-teams. This is what the peer evaluation system looks like. Uh, this is probably the thing that uh, is one of the biggest contributions we made on these in terms of tools for running VIP. So each student answers these questions for the students they work with most closely on their team. So a team of 50, you're not evaluating everybody. You're evaluating maybe the eight people that are part of your sub-team. And uh, the first three are really a social networking question. Who's working with whom and how are they exchanging information? There are other things about communication dependability. They have to split a 10K bonus amongst the students they're evaluating, so they're forced to rank the students on the team. And they're also required to provide some input. And so the red tells you when somebody gave that student a ranking in that category that was two standard deviations below average. Well, what? Excuse me, light red or yellow is one standard deviation. This is right at the average. Um, light green is a standard deviation above average, and dark green is two standard deviations above average. So you can tell just by looking at it that the student on the far right is having some problems. And if you read the comment, this is a student who's very knowledgeable on the material related to the team, but needs to be more committed. So this is a student who really has and should be pulling their, uh, their weight more than they are. So that'll probably be two A's and a B. Let's get that. Now the other thing that's crucial is how VIP credits count towards a student's degree. Now, this is what we do at Georgia Tech. Every university is a little bit different, uh, but we've studied this at Georgia Tech and have looked at credit use policies and how they correlate with how many semesters a student participates in a team. So what we've found is we have a threshold type of policy. If you only take five or fewer VIP credits, they only count as free electives. As soon as you take the sixth credit, uh, in my department, three of them become an ECE elective. In biomedical engineering, all six of them become a biomedical engineering elective. And uh, what they do on their VIP team can also count uh, for senior design credit in engineering. Uh, in other departments, it may count for senior thesis or for uh, research credit. So this is department by department, college by college, and even university by university. So when it comes time for you to formulate your credit use policies, be sure to talk with us. Um, and uh, in terms of, for those of you who are, who are professors, uh, there's always the question of what credit do I get for having a VIP team? Uh, we've seen three approaches. One is there's no course release time for the advisors. Um, this tends to be in departments where there are heavy teaching loads. And there you don't get any teaching release time. The reward for you is having, being able to do more in your research than you could have before because you have a team. The generous version is to say for the primary advisor of a team, you get released from one course a year to advise your team. Now the problem with that is if every, if every faculty member had a team, there wouldn't be anybody to teach any of the regular courses. So we actually recommend this one. So when you're starting up a team, the first two years, that's when you have to educate everybody on the team. And then, the, and then you have some experienced returning members who train the new members. So you should get credit for teaching the first two years, and then after that the team should be contributing to your research. And that way your department can budget for a certain number of uh, VIP team startups each year. Uh, access and diversity. Again, we've learned a lot here. So for joining teams, we don't allow any interviews, there's no GPA screening, and there are no prerequisites. Uh, because we found that none of them are correlated with performance on the team. And uh, for instance, prerequisites, 
you're on the team long enough, and the team is usually specialized enough that you learn what you need to know the first semester or two you're on the team. Uh, GPA just isn't correlated, it doesn't test for the same set of skills that you need for a research project. And there are several papers on the literature about this. Thing. And finally, interviews. Um, even, even Google has published something about this. They went back and they looked at their most uh, capable employees. They traced it back to see what was the best indicator that they were going to be great employees. It wasn't the interview results and it wasn't uh, GPA. It was the performance as interns uh, during summer internships. And so for us, the best indicator of whether a student is going to be successful on a VIP team is their enthusiasm for the project. So that's why we let them pick the projects that they want to join, because you assume they're picking one that they're really interested in. And uh, we've been studying VIP for many, many years. Um, this is just a selection of the results that we have. So for example, uh, we have questions on the exit survey that every graduating senior, every graduating final year student uh, is requested to answer. And one of the questions on there was, uh, did your time at Georgia Tech um, improve your ability to work in a multidisciplinary team? And so there are some VIP students who answered that question and some non-VIP students who answered that question. And they're very carefully matched up by which discipline they were, what the grade point average was, uh, so to try to eliminate any kind of biases. And so the hypothesis was that VIP made no difference. So the probability we would have seen the results we got, if that were true, was less than 0 0.001. And then B is uh, basically how the separation between the distributions for the VIP students and non-VIP students. So this is a really meaningful educational result. Same thing with individual, working with individuals from diverse backgrounds, understanding technology applications relevant to your field of study. And we have many papers about VIP that are on our website. Uh, so benefits to students, these are real teams. You join a team just like you would join a company. You don't know many of the people. You have to learn them, you have to come up to speed, be productive, eventually you take on a leadership role. Um, you get to think deeply and within your own field and you learn and you're there long enough that you learn how to work with people from other fields that are part of the project. Um, and it's great preparation for both work and grad school. Uh, we actually, Purdue University is doing a study right now to see uh, if VIP students are more likely to go to graduate students to graduate school than students who have been in VIP. And for faculty, probably the biggest benefit is it's much better organized, much more effective uh, undergrad research. And it's a way to get them involved and contribute to your research in ways that uh, will really surprise you in terms of how well they do it. And it's because you get continuity of knowledge and experience on the team from semester to semester and year to year. Um, and then again, the students on your team picked your team because they're interested in what you're doing. And as I said, it's that enthusiasm that uh, makes them successful. So these are all the universities that have VIP programs right now. Uh, so we have 24 in the US, uh, 11 around the world. Uh, University of New South Wales just joined, so we now have one VIP, at least one VIP site on every continent except Antarctica. Um, and then there are some other universities that uh, we're hoping will join, so I've added UNICAMP to that. <laughs> so we're hoping you decide to join us, because then you can be moved under the international category. And so in the U.S. we have a very wide variety of institutions, big, small, public, private, uh, very research intensive for yeah, AAU schools the top 60 universities in the U.S. Um, and uh, a lot that serve underrepresented minorities. So we meet once a year. All the directors of all the VIP sites, each VIP site would send uh, two representatives. And uh, what we do is we discuss the definition of VIP, what makes it work, what makes it doesn't work, how to make it better, how we all work together. And so the meeting this year is going to be May 9th and 10th um, in Atlanta at Georgia Tech. And one of the things we, do, we discuss every year is what the essential characteristics are for VIP. So to call yourself a VIP site, it has to be set up this way. And the reason for this is this is what makes it work. And we know that if you deviate from this, it doesn't work very well. Um, so it has to be led by research faculty. Uh, it has to be support projects 
embedded in professor's research efforts. So we start teams at the request of faculty. We don't start teams at the request of companies or the request of special efforts on campus, strategic efforts. We just prefer to have lots of teams and then a company shop our list of teams to find teams to partner with. Or say a service learning initiative on campus will look at all of our teams that are service learning related and claim those. So remember, it only started if a professor requests it. Um, multidisciplinary teams really make this work really well. And it has to be curricular and all students agree. And then the overall VIP consortium. Everybody has to have a professor-led team, a professor-led program. Uh, has to have the essential characteristics of VIP, but they can adapt because as we've learned going around different institutions in the U.S. and around the world, everybody's a little different. Um, and, you know, the consortium is big enough now, we can probably find somebody who looks similar to Unicamp. But we all share resources, tools, and processes. There's no fee to join. Um, and everybody is asked to just contribute what you can. So tell us what your experiences are, what works, and what doesn't work for you. And we all participate, we publish papers together, we write proposals, we do evaluation work together. And so I always like to ask uh, you know, professors and you know, research scientists, research engineers, uh, is what they think they could do if they had a VIP team. And uh, so if I go to a new discipline at Georgia Tech, this is my last slide. And it always generates at least a couple of uh, requests to talk with me. For professors in that discipline, and then it just grows from there. So, that's it. And by the way, one of the reasons this works is it's just a lot of fun. I have a lot of fun with my team. They really pull off some neat stuff, and uh, I always take the whole team out to dinner each semester uh, just to celebrate what they've done. Agora nós vamos ter um momento de perguntas e respostas, então alguém gostaria de começar? Em português ou em inglês? Hey, thank you for your visit. I'm Josh Lovac from Mac Engineering here at Recap. Um, from your slide number 50, do you go back a little bit, please? So, yeah, so, yeah, so the, the specs of the VAP team. It seems very much like our extracurricular one that we have. At Mac Engineer, for example, we have uh, a team that builds like model airplanes and model cars and solar cars and like and they go to competitions and stuff. How, except for the part that the program is curricular, right. it seems that this is pretty much the premise, right? Well, we have some teams that are competition teams, um, but as long as the competition is uh, sort of wide open in terms of innovation, and there's a faculty member who's interested in it from the research point of view then they can be a VIP team. So for instance, uh, the Agile Communication Architecture team, uh, that's a DARPA challenge team. So DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And you know, they hold these long-term, you know, five or more year challenges where you build a big system and you're competing with other universities. And there are no specs other than being able to achieve certain levels of performance. And so that's a really serious research problem, as well as a problem of building a system that can achieve that. So that's a competition team that is a VIP team. There are some competition teams that we've refused to allow to become uh, VIP teams because the, there's so much repetition each year in terms of what the team does that there really isn't enough innovation there for it to be a VIP team. So yes, some competition teams, no to some others. Um, and we just have to make that judgment on our own. And so the ones that get in, yes, it does count for academic credit. Yeah,
Sou coordenador associado do curso de administração lá da FCA. Meu nome é Cristiano Morini. Então, explicar a little, a little words about how how can you we, we met first. É, eu estava é, em setembro é, conheci, visitando uma universidade lá na Escócia para conhecer inovações pedagógicas, para a gente implementar no curso de administração na FCA. E aí, lá na Escócia, é, eu, eu conheci a iniciativa do VIP. Aí eu fui perguntando para o pessoal como que era isso, né? como, que é, como que era feito, como funcionava, quem podia participar. E aí eles apresentaram tudo como funciona lá na, naquela universidade, a Universidade de Strathclyde, em Glasgow. E, e aí eu perguntei, mas foram vocês que criaram esse programa? Quem que criou? Aí eles falaram que não, que o, o idealizador do programa é o professor Ed Cole. E aí eu entrei em contato com ele e o professor Ed nos recep recebeu muito bem então, na, nas conversas que a gente teve via Skype. E, e aí a gente é, entende que essa proposta ela tem muito está muito em consonância com o que a, a pró-reitoria de graduação vem estimulando aqui na Unicamp, que são as inovações pedagógicas, a reformulação dos projetos pedagógicos é, e outras iniciativas é, de modernização da, do ensino superior. E lá na FCA, especialmente, a gente tem uma, uma já tem um, algumas coisas que a gente faz com ênfase na multidisciplinaridade, então, essa questão da multidisciplinaridade é bastante forte lá, que está bastante em consonância também com essa proposta do VIP. E aí a gente convidou o professor para vir apresentar a ideia dele aqui na Unicamp. Né? Então, ele vai ficar hoje aqui em Barão e amanhã lá na FCA, no campus lá em Limeira. Então, a ideia é, acabando também hoje aqui a apresentação, se vocês tiverem mais... É, perguntas ou interesse em implementar ou o que fazer, como fazer, trocar informações. É, eu gostaria de me colocar à disposição também para a gente poder é, iniciar essa, essa discussão. E gostaria já antecipadamente de agradecer a presença de todos aqui. O Tiago já, já fez isso também, né? Agradecer aqui em nome da, do, do E2, né, Tiago? Então. É, pergunta se alguém preferir fazer em português ou em inglês, né? Fique à vontade. Ah, já pergunta. Então, é, porque eu ia perguntar, é, ele apresentou aqui, só por causa da gravação. Ele apresentou aqui o, a, as informações técnicas do, do projeto, mas aí precisa de um plano de ação para começar a se concretizar. Eu queria saber quem era a liderança do, do VIP na Unicamp para implementar ele mesmo. É, isso a gente ainda não tem, né? Isso. Who will be the leader here at Unicamp to, to make the, the contact with you? Yes, yes. <laughs> é, isso é uma, uma coisa que a gente ainda não, não definiu. É, então, nós, nós, inclusive, gostaríamos de coletar ideias aqui dos professores que estão aqui também, dos coordenadores, como que, a gente, como que vocês pensam que a gente poderia começar. É, eu acho que uma, uma proposta seria a gente, alguma unidade, começar a oferecer uma proposta e aí isso estimula a, o debate e a discussão, ou poderia vir de forma mais institucional também, né? a partir da, da pró-reitoria, uma, uma proposta como essa. Isso está tá em aberto, então a gente está aceitando sugestões aí. Certo? Você é aluno de... Engenharia de computação, é, tem bastante... Engenharia de Engenharia de Olá, eu sou o Carlos. Eu não falo pouco português mesmo, porque eu tenho vergonha de falar inglês. No caso, eu sou da RT. Na parte de Limeira, eu sou de computação. E essa parte está sendo muito interessante que ele falou, porque a nossa área, computação, ela, ela precisa muito dessa interdisciplinaridade, porque você tem, muito, você tem que estudar o tempo todo, toda hora. 
Só que você, no, você percebe que a faculdade não está dando esse suporte. Às vezes você tem que procurar cursos fora, você tem que conseguir fazer outras coisas fora da faculdade, sendo que a faculdade só oferece o básico, sendo que o mercado de trabalho está oferecendo coisas mais complicadas. E ele já está falando bem crescer com esses grupos, que é você interagir com outras pessoas de outras áreas para você conseguir já conseguir entrar no mercado de trabalho de uma forma mais preparada com o um grupo. E isso eu achei fantástico, eu achei muito bom, porque essa área está precisando bastante, porque está faltando essa modernização na área. Por exemplo, a gente por exemplo, pega o básico em computação, mas a gente tem que pegar muita coisa por fora porque não dá conta para o mercado de trabalho. E isso que ele está fazendo é muito interessante que já dá essa modernizada e dá essa alavancada, coloca uma equipe, que é como se fosse equipe mesmo, tem grupos de programação. Isso é uma coisa que seria muito boa. Com as outras áreas também, computação com a área de medicina, com a, com a área de biologia, com outras áreas, isso fica fantástico. So, if they are on the same VIP team for at least uh, three semesters and they earn at least six credits, then it automatically satisfies their design requirement, no matter what VIP team they're on. Because whatever VIP team they're on, they're using their you know, computer skills, computational skills, to move the project forward. So computer science really loves this, because it's a way for their students to get experience outside the district. Now, we do have some teams that are you know, hardcore you know, computer science, computer engineering teams. They have a team, the Lopez Gallery, which looks at how processing architectures. You know, they have other teams that look at uh, embedded systems uh, for security and other purposes. Um, but uh, they can join any team and get credit. Ali, se você percebeu também o número da a curva. Veja só como, é, desde o primeiro oferecimento, né, nesse modelo do VIP 3.3.0, yes, em 2009, até hoje. Né? Então, eu acho que se a gente começar a oferecer aqui também na Unicamp uma ou outra é, disciplina nesse formato, com o tempo, é, outras, outras faculdades, outros professores vão se, podem ir se engajando e o número de de aderência a essa ideia pode ir aumentando, sem dúvida. Né? There is a question here. Uh, she asked me to ask you how long does it uh, it takes for a professor, for, for example, a graduate student and a undergraduate student it per week in in this project in in average. Okay. Um, well, for for uh, professors. Uh, we, we kept careful track of the time of advisors on several different teams, and it's the equivalent of teaching approximately half of a regular course, um, half the time of a regular class. So when we recommend being getting release time for one year, we think of it as half a course per semester. So now for the graduate students, um, it varies depending on how tightly tied what the team is doing uh, is with the graduate students' research. Um, Uh, they are often kind of the interface between the undergraduates and the uh, faculty member. So some of the more detailed questions would be handled by the graduate student because they're working closely with them. And then the harder long range views and harder problems would be addressed you know, with the graduate student and the team. So, and each team works a little differently. So uh, it, it takes on some of the personality of the advisor, it takes on characteristics of the area in which they're working. You know, every team is a little bit different. Okay. Thank you. Um, my name is Alfredo. I'm from geology here. Uh, I have a question related to who supports these um, disciplines. Like, for instance, if you have a project that involves money, um, do you have a partnership with industry or, uh, or the university supports this? Um, the university does not support this, and just as they don't support any research project, um, and also the VIP program does not subsidize any teams. So one of the benefits of having a VIP team is that uh, when you have your team listed there, along with all the other teams, uh, companies in the U.S. now regularly scan our list of teams 
to find ones that are close to the areas in which they're working. And then we have a way for them to donate money to the team um, that uh, comes in unrestricted. Uh, can be used to buy equipment, do field trips, you know, whatever the team needs. And often that evolves into an actual research project between the advisor and the companies. So that's what happened with my team, for example. So for three years, we got uh, $15,000 a year from Harris Corporation, and they're now supporting one of the PhD students who works on the team. Um, the other advantage of VIP is that, and again, this is specific to the U.S., which is what I know best, um, the National Science Foundation, every proposal is required to have uh, an additional two sections, one on education and one on water impact. And VIP has become the preferred way uh, for uh, people to involve undergraduates in their research and to talk about that in the research proposal. So we provide letters of support for those proposals that go in, and then when they're funded, we help them start the team. So, and we also give them content that they can include in their proposals. And we've gotten great feedback from NSF about VIP. Uh, a lot of other uh, funding organizations in the U.S., uh, instead of calling it education, uh, they call it workforce development. So they really want to see more students produced in a particular area uh, for the workforce, as well as supporting the research. And VIP is actually included in research proposals there as well. So it's up to the individual faculty member to fund the activities of the team, just like you fund the activities of your uh, graduate students. Um, so the only thing we provide within VIP is the infrastructure that helps make the whole program work and make it easy for professors to do it. Now there is one exception to that. And the exception is a lot of our teams need sophisticated computational capability and for the students to really learn how to do things they have to have full admin rights on servers and you know, everything else that the student is doing. Well, if you ask your information technology folks on campus if they'll allow that, they'll say no great way. Uh, so we actually created a little server cloud and firewalled it off from the rest of campus. And any team can have as many virtual servers as they want um, on our cloud. So that's the only technical subsidy we provide to any VIP teams. And we're trying to convince uh, Amazon to provide that for the entire consortium. So any team anywhere that needs a server could have a virtual server up in the Amazon cloud. Um, haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> I think once we're big enough, then they'll want to do it. Um, thank you, Professor Coyle, for your nice talk. And uh, I was interested, based on the, the pie chart that you show, uh, specific on this on the on the course that the students that the students follow uh, the VIP project and uh, on the on the type of project that you propose the Ardo Tech uh, is mainly is mainly composed of engineering and computer science courses. That's just historic. That's just historic. It started in engineering because I'm in engineering, and uh, so you notice that actually my department has two degrees. So this is electrical and computer engineering. This is computer science, you know, and then mechanical engineering came on board, then biomedical engineering. Uh, the most recent ones to join are, uh, say, in the sciences and the humanities. Uh, but there, those teams are starting to proliferate now, too. So yeah. long term, we would like to see this reflect the composition of the student body by nature. But the original question, actually, was among the 35 members of the, uh, both in the U.S. and international, oh. uh, does do all they follow the same pattern? No. Um, Oops. Okay, so uh, most of them have started in engineering, but there are exceptions. So University of uh, UC Davis, University of California Davis, uh, University of Georgia. Um, There's one international one. Um, okay, anyway, there are four universities where it started in the sciences first. And then it's spreading to engineering as opposed to starting in engineering and spreading the science. Now, we haven't yet seen any start in the humanities. The one exception to that uh, was 
you know, the University of Strathclyde. And because VIP often starts within a single discipline, you get a critical mass of people interested in doing it, and then it spreads. Uh, sometimes an entire college will start it, you know, all of engineering or all of science. Um, oh, Iowa State is the other one. That's it. Uh, Iowa State is also starting up in the arts and sciences. Um, but Strathclyde actually started at the, well, they call him a principal, a president or a chancellor. Um, I think you call him a president here. The rector. The rector. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so the principal of Strathclyde decided that the entire university was going to do this after he heard about it. So they had the first liberal arts teams of any university. Your discipline. Any more questions? So the program at UC Davis has a very, and, and the University of Georgia has a very heavy biochemistry <coughs> feel to it at this point. Okay. Anyone else? So we have a cough out there. Uh, if you prefer to ask directly to the prof to professor, <laughs> not in public, <laughs> you can do it there. So let's thank you again, professor. <laughs>